I'm one of the co-chairs of the Sustainability Committee in town. If you don't know me already, I'm using a computer that is not on. Um, so welcome today. We have a wonderful compost lecture with Domingo Medina. And also, if you have not seen the wonderful ladies coming around with the tablets, if you have not yet filled out our survey for what you think as a Woodbridge resident about compost, please absolutely fill it out on the tablets today or um, get the link. And um, let us know what you think. If you're here, I'm guessing you're actually pretty interested in composting. Um, but we actually are interested to tell your neighbors and friends and everybody who even aren't interested because we're actually very curious to know why people are not composting right now. So very important to know that as much as why you guys want to compost. So um, we want to get everybody to find different ways that we can encourage everyone to compost. Also, we just today opened up sales for compost barrels, rain barrels. Um, there is this in the back of the room too, so you can um, take a picture of the QR code and go to the website if you want to take a look. It's more than just these two um, options. There's actually tumbler barrels and all sorts of other fun. So um, take a look at that again, tell your neighbors, your friends, there are ways in which to do this now. All right, our next lecture is going to be March. Um, we're always on the third Saturday of every month, so it's March 16th, and it's gonna be recycling next month. And the biggest, most exciting thing going on is April 27th, please join us. It's gonna be a town-wide event. Um, there's gonna be a lot of events right here on the green, but also throughout the town, at the farms, at all the businesses, hopefully, as well. We're going to be doing a very, very, very big Earth Day event. Um, save the date. And also, let us know. Contact us if your organization wants to be part of this in any kind of way. We'd love to have everybody involved. And now, last but not least, the man of the hour. This is Domingo Medina. He is a very, very wonderful, talented, and um, fabulous person who knows more about compost than all of us combined, I'm pretty sure. So. Um, please, welcome. Thank you. And I'm uh, very impressed with the amount of people that showed up. Uh, I normally have uh, smaller crowds. Uh, not many people are into compost. Um, and something that I that I realized is that uh, composting was an actual skill that many households had in the 40s and the 50s. You know, there was no much collection of organic waste in any place and people knew how to compost and uh, uh, and as things uh, developed over time with the use of plastics and other you know processed food you know we moved away uh, and evolved that responsibility of composting to municipalities uh, and I'm going to touch a little bit upon that uh, so I'm probably going to move through different scales I don't know Certainly, we're talking mostly about composting, backyard composting, well reference. You need a little bit higher? Okay, oh, here it comes. <laughs> yes, uh, that's okay. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, inverted triangle, but this is uh, um, basically a hierarchy to reduce food waste uh, to grow uh, within your community. And things that are being pushed right now is that a way to reduce uh, organic waste in our community is to start from a uh, source reduction for the way we buy our food, the way we prepare our food, the way we preserve our food. Uh, so we don't have a, you know, a larger output that then needs to be thrown away somehow. And uh, the hierarchy, what it says is that if you uh, still have a, an, an accident of, um, of food, then you should be, you know, a rescuing that food, giving it to animals, giving it to people that might need it, and that's why we have uh, a, a lot of movements around not only in New Haven but elsewhere of people going out to Trader Joe's, going to the different uh, large supermarket, and trying to capture those food that are otherwise going to be uh, uh, wasted and giving it to people that need it. Now you still have a lot of overflow within household and within businesses, and the rest recommendation is. Can you compost it? Can you help compost at home? If not, can you compost it in a community uh, garden? Uh, if not, is there a service around your area where uh, these collection can happen? The idea is that is to avoid along the way the landfilling, the incineration uh, of this uh, organic waste. It's estimated that around 35 to 40 percent of the content of our trash, every time we throw away uh, our trash bags, 
it's organic waste. It's organic material that can be composted in one way or another. And we're not doing it yet. To the point that now we used to have landfills here in Connecticut. We shut it down in 2006, uh, six, six, uh, yeah, 2006, uh, 16, I remember. Uh, then, you know, everything was going to a municipal incinerator up in uh, Hartford and still here in Bridgeport. Those are closing down or have closed down already because they, you know, they are all technology. There was some money there to be upgraded. And now we're moving towards the era of anaerobic digester, the production of methane uh, through the uh, capture uh, of the usual organic waste. So those are, that's where we are right now in terms of how we are managing our, <coughs> our resources. Um, okay, and this is a slide that uh, represents that, that shows you um, a little bit how we went. We went from, you still find in many places down in Haven, these um, underground garbage receivers uh, behind, on one side of the house or behind the house that were in, you know, basically buried in the soil with a very heavy lid and that's where we used to have, a, you know, a horses with a metal carriages that would take this material up, out and would take it to piggeries to provide food for pig, uh, pig, uh, um, piggeries. And there were like three piggeries in New Haven and they used to be uh, linked to also poor houses where you had people that were marginalized in the city but they were able to work in this farm, take care of the pigs, eat and sell uh, the pigs and was part of a, a way to attain that, that economy. Uh, of course, in the 1920s, we moved away from that, and somebody decided, no, land fillings, that's the proper thing to do, to do, to do. create these barren spaces and take you know, spaces like a, a marginalized areas like a marsh that are very much valued now and create these land fillings. So each city has these landfills. Uh, because of the environmental impact of all those landfills, you know, they decided to be capped and, 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 and be closed. And, but we had, as a solution, municipal incineration. <coughs> With municipal incineration, we certainly were able to receive and haul a lot of material, uh, but there were, uh, you know, major consideration of uh, air pollution. We have one of the highest incidents of pulmonary cancer and asthma in the state with the New London, with the New Bridgeport. And I'm not saying because of incineration, but if you already have a sick population and you're polluting your environment, is not helping out. So that, the last one, the big mirror up in uh, Connecticut, uh, Hartford was closed uh, last year. So now we're exporting 40% of what we produce in terms of waste, we put it into trucks, sending it elsewhere. I don't know uh, uh, where it's going. We are paying for transportation costs, which the tipping fee has gone up. Uh, and there's another community out there that's receiving uh, the benefits of we trashing them. So that's how it's see. Now the mid movement is, is towards an anaerobic digester. We only have one active here in Salinton. Uh, that's where uh, many of our organic waste has been collected by uh, teams like Blue Earth Compost uh, in Hartford and Curbside Compost uh, in Fairfield. They're, go uh, they're going up to Salinton uh, feeding these systems that requires a lot of organic waste to be able to produce the methane for the uh, gas industry. Now, these are something that Woodbridge won't be able to pay, or even New Haven will be paid. These are highly costly systems, uh, but that seems to be where the incentives are and where the investments are. Hmm. Uh, so, can I just yes. So, is that like the, the gas, like when you're saying, what is the gas that's created? It creates methane. Okay. What so, it's it's a it's a it's a basically it's a composting process. Uh, in anaerobic conditions, uh, using uh, uh, anaerobes that are able to produce a lot of amount of, uh, of, of methane. Uh -huh. There's a byproduct called a digest. Okay. That digest still needs to be composted. Okay. Uh, at this point, we don't know where it's going and what's being doing with that. But if you know a little bit about compost, uh, and at that scale, uh, or municipal scale, there's a lot of contaminants in that digest. Uh -huh. So that's a big question. It's what's happening with that digest. So it's not a, a clear solution. Uh, certainly it's responding to a need uh, of many municipalities of getting rid of that organic waste and reduce the amount that's going into trash. Uh, but it's highly, highly costly uh, at this point. Yes. About the methane, is that used to um, create energy for the uh, grid? 
Does it do they supposed to get yeah. or is yeah. that to, for natural gas? Or it's for it's for, it's for gas to put into the grid. Okay. Uh, so like it it, it huh? makes a turbine pump the the electricity into the grid. Or well, no, no. This is just a, no. This this is to provide natural gas. You know, methane for the uh, for the gas industry. Okay. You know, to cooking stoves and. Uh, oh, okay. Kind of, uh, yeah. Natural. So is it run by like UI or Eversource? No, no. These are all private. They, they mean, the last time I checked, these are billions of dollars of investment to be able to build one of these. There are smaller scales ones that are being uh, promoted for uh, for farms, mainly farms that deal with manure. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are, you know, uh, uh, up there in terms of, of cost. You said that that when they do this in this facility. It contaminates what's left over, and then we don't know where that's going. That's a that's the question. Is that and I collect organic waste on a weekly basis, right. and even though I educate the public, I have ways to reduce. I still receive a lot of contaminants, mm -hmm. and so plastic, pieces of metal, and oh. you know, a pesticide a, a material that have been linked to, to. So even though I'm trying to clean it up. When you are collecting at a huge amount of scale, it's hard to control what's coming and what comes out. The so they receive the material. Would be because the grocery stores sell you fr fruit with pesticides. It could be coming. It could be com coming from flowers that come from stores that has a lot of herbicide and pesticides. In the okay. Uh, so that's a source. It, you know, it, come, it might come from lint. You know, that is you have a lot of microplastics uh, that you might find in your household through okay. the drying of the material. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have been known, uh, you know, PFAS, is chlorides, uh, that are all this additive that you find in these, um, what's called foodware, the plates and the, and, the, and the utensils that are made of, of uh, bioplastic, but they add these chloride to make them sturdy and uh, protect them uh, against the breakdown of water. Uh, so I know that that's a, a fact, and the only way to educate people not to do it. And, uh, and that happens also in recycling this. So for them, they, ha they, they try to discern as best as we can be, but this is all mechanical. It's not somebody making a decision what can you go in and what can go out. And then the digest is basically what is it, whatever is left of that material when you have extracted water, you extracted, you know, uh, those, uh, the, the methane. Uh, and what are they doing with that? They say they're composting it. That they're making, co uh, that selling compost. I haven't seen the first pack yet, but that's the way that it's being pushed, uh, uh, and that's uh, an issue. Okay, um, so what I'm going to concentrate today is about how to make compost. For me, and the question that I ask you, is, you know, why to compost in the first place? And uh, for me, the reality might be just waste management. I want to be able to get rid of that organic waste that's being produced in the household. I'm the responsible for you to deal with that, and therefore any quick and efficient solution for that, I, I will invest on that. That's one way. The other way is say, listen, uh, can we see food waste as a resource? Can we uh, utilize that resource to make compost, to enhance soils in our place, to be able to provide and build organic matter in farms that are needed as much, uh, for community gardens, for erosion controls. That's a different type of question. That's a different type of... Uh, so when you talk to people in your community, they have to make a decision, you know, why are we doing compost in the first place? Because depending on that answer, the investment and interest and the political will will be different. Okay? Uh, so basically, you know, the why of compost is something that I always... Uh, uh, is key for me. And then things to comprehend that I really want people to understand that yes, compost can be something mechanical, uh, but it's also something that is uh, interesting because for me, it's working with nature. How can I work with nature to be able to take advantage of food as a resource and not as a waste uh, 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 material? Okay. Uh, I have a business called Peels and Wheels Composting. Uh, I've been doing this for 10 years now. We collect organic waste that are being produced in households, in offices, in schools. We pick up with a system of bikes and trailers around. And we used to operate from Phoenix Press, uh, which just closed down. Um, and now we are in partnership with the Common Ground High School where we process most of our material. But this was our motivation. We say, why do we compost? And I say, by diverting food waste from municipal incineration and towards composting, 
We reduce the cost of waste and environmental pollution in Haven linked to human health, and we have a chance to create rich soil amendments for growing plants and food in our place while creating local jobs. So there's a lot of synergy, there's a lot of potential ben uh, beneficial impact. When we talk about green economy, for me, doing composting is very close to what that means. It's, again, utilizing that resources to create a product that can enhance our environment, but also can create some job for, uh, that's much needed within our community. So I'm going to be able, I'm going to try to answer some of these, um, go through this material as much as I can. But most important is that if you have any question along the way, what well, the end is important. How many of you are actually composting right now at home? Ooh. How do you feel about your compost? Are you proud of your compost? <laughs> <laughs> Would you give that as a gift to awesome. your neighbors? That's a different yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I'll try to answer some questions as much as I can. So what is console? Uh, what's, I want you to appreciate this because when I say that we're working with nature, that's what we're actually doing. We are creating conditions for the natural decomposition of organic material. Okay? And this is the definition. A cons a composting is the biological decomposition of organic matter by microorganisms into a biological stable, pathogen free, humus rich substance suitable for soils and growing plants. I'm not going. <laughs> Why are you going? Okay. Uh, under special control conditions of aeration, moisture, and thermophilic temperature. It's a, a mouthful of information. But at the, at the end is that decomposition of organic material is going to happen independently of us. It's happening right now in the forest, even though we're under the winter. It's a biological process of basically decomposition, of mineralization and humidification by, by bacteria and fungi and other microorganisms. But when we talk about composting, is that we're actually creating the conditions to accelerate that process. Okay? Decomposition in a natural form will take probably a year or more, depending on the environmental condition that's happening. But we can actually break down a, a decomposed material in a matter of 18 days if we actively compost. So what I'm going to talk about today is that is what we can do to accelerate that process. So in a matter of three months, four months, we can have a stable material that is healthy enough for our plants a, to be able to incorporate into our soils. Good. Some of the benefits, you know about this a lot. Uh, you know, we basically are supplying the organic matter that our soils are very much needed with compost. Uh, we also supply a lot of those beneficial microorganisms, our uh, bacteria, our fungi, our arthropods, our, our protozoas. Those are the ones that, uh, through the soil food web, are going to be able to allow for the circulation of nutrients within our soil. And the uh, those of you that are farmers, you know that part of doing farming is that you uh, are impacting your soil, the organic matter, that you're removing some of the organic matter, of those nutrients that uh, you are, uh, you, each time you harvest, uh, all that nutrients that went into the plants are being removed from the soil, and somehow we have to replenish that. And one indicator of a good farm is the percentage of organic matter. Uh, and compost is one of those practices that with other practice can contribute to the build-up of organic matter. Um, and one of the things beautiful about composting that improves the soil structure, it allows to form aggregates, and by forming aggregates, you can capture water. And you can also allow for infiltration uh, of water uh, properly, and, and aggregate the soil. Uh, that is very, very important. The other thing is that there's some uh, nutrients in the soil and because uh, a lot of that nutrients are ingrained in the structure of organic matter and in the body of those microbes, you have, you have a very slow release of, um, of nutrients. You might not supply all the nutrient values that you might need for certain crops if you are into farming, but certainly it's a nice baseline to have. Uh, uh, but most important here is the, uh, the, the functional and the viability of the soil food web uh, to be able to play its role. The other thing is, the, um, given the property of the organic matter, it behaves very much like um, clay in the soil, which basically 
the structure allows for nutrients, uh, what's called the cation exchange capacity, the ability to hold the nutrients and to make it available uh, through the process of uh, the soil food web. Another thing that is important for a compost is that provides beneficial organisms, as I, as I mentioned before. It balances the pH. If you do well your compost, it tends to go around a, you know, 6.5 and 8 in the scale of pH, which is a very good for the majority of the crops that you want to grow. Um, another thing is that it helps to suppress harmful organisms and diseases uh, because you have all these uh, beneficial organisms, they outcompete, you know, uh, those uh, anaerobic uh, type of pathogens that might affect your plants and that generate diseases. Um, the other thing is that it's um, it's very good at the time of summer and the time of winter because it temperates the extremes of weather. And one of the things that we know is that a lot of times compost can also uh, make less bioavailable bio things like lead and arsenic and other metals. So these are things that have been studied uh, that uh, provide uh, for some benefits. Thinking about doing compost, of, uh, or, you know, think about how you have set up your own composting system. And you, these are things you have to put, need to pay attention. Is, you know, you need a way to store your organic waste. Are you putting into a little pile, you know, if you have a little container in your kitchen, uh, where is it? Uh, is it is it is accessible? Is easy to manage? Um, then you need to have a place where you're going to be basically mixing your raw material. That green material that you're collecting from your kitchen has to be combined with brown material. I'm going to explain that a bit later. But you need a place where you're going to mix that, if you're going to mix it, depending on the method of composting. But then you need a, a place where you're going to have actually your active compost. Are you going to be using bins? Are you going to do it tumblers? Are you going to have a three bin system? Are you going to do the trenching? You know, and so that's another area that you have to have. And once, uh, after the compost, active compost, you have a place where you have to allow for that material to mature, to cure, meaning that things are decomposed enough so there's no much more biological activity happening and there's no, uh, no any toxicity of your compost left, so it's ready to be used for the ground. Uh, some people will save their material because they prefer to take out the coarse material that may come from your compost and other supply directly. So think about the system. It has to be something that is uh, logistically it will do it. It will facilitate you to do composting. If you put it in the backyard that is 200 meters away and it's cold and you know and it's under the bushes and you have to lift tarps, you're not going to do it. So you have to do something that is sustainable uh, as a practice, as brushing your teeth, as you know, uh, something that you can do it as part of the second nature. Uh, think about uh, never mind where you put it. Uh, honestly. The people say, well, you have to shade it in the summer because you don't want so much evaporation of the water that comes to your system. Uh, as long as you have a lid or you have a cover, that will take care of. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, um, it's not so much an issue. You have to put it in a, in a place in the winter that is, uh, is protected against the wind. If not, you can look, you need a way to protect from that. Because if your system is very small, uh, you know, less than three by three by three in terms of of size, it, it will not have the insulating properties to not be impacted by the outside uh, temperature. So it can become a, a, a block of ice, and then it won't be, you know, we able you to use it. But if you have enough size, it won't freeze on in the winter time as long as you manage it uh, uh, with certain frequency. Uh, you want to protect it from the rain. Sometimes, you know, people have it in an open pit, and when you have a big snow or heavy rain, that might flood your whole pile and therefore uh, all those pockets of air that you might need get flooded and you might start having what's called a, a, you know, foul odors. That's an indication that things are, are anaerobic and therefore you have all that bad smell. So you want to be able to cover with a tarp, with a, 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 a compost stick material like a felt or a lid uh, because you want to control for the moisture level uh, when that happens. Um, one thing that I really recommend and I've seen it in a lot of places it, depending where you put your bin, you want it to be in a place that the ground is, you know, is, is compacted. 
uh, you can put it on, on a concrete base, you can put it over bricks, or you can really compact. Because if, not, if, you're, not, if you're not going to use a compost, I assure you, all the groves and your plants around it are going to encro encroach in your compost bin. And then when you're going to, oh, it's spring time, I'm going to harvest, and then you're fighting with your roots. Because incredibly, uh, trees and plants, they know where the nutrients are, and they'll go after it very, very quickly. So anything that you can do to minimize that, uh, it, it, you know, helps you for uh, harvesting and using that material. Uh, what else I think that's important here? Um, you know, there's some sometimes there are some ordinance of what is uh, allowed to be composted in the backyard, uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But what's important is that you know you have a well organized space, so it doesn't create odors, it doesn't uh, attract potential rodents, uh, and might be some type of nuisance for your neighbor. Uh, if you do it well, there's no issue at all. Okay, uh, so. these are things that I recommend to have. Uh, basically, the most important thing is that you have to decide on the system that you want to have. Whether you're going to be just to using a pile, are you going to work with bins, are you going to work with a tumbler, are you going to have a pallet and a three bin system. Uh, so that's key. The other key that you really, really need is kind of a shovel or a spade. Uh, uh, for what I do is to reduce the particle size of material. Every time I bring things from the kitchen, you want to reduce the particle size. If you have a pumpkin and you just throw a pumpkin, it's going to take much, much longer. You, have to, you need to be able to expose your organic waste to the action of microbes. And using things like a spade or shovel uh, allows you to do that. Uh, and then you, have, you need a way to aerate the whole system. Uh, I'm going to go more into detail of what it means, but these are basic tools. Your system that you need, a way to move material and to break down material and to aerate, and some way to water the system. Those are the most important things to have. Uh, the rest is, you know, if you get very fancy, you can deal with the other ones. What's the difference between like you the three systems, like the, three, the three bin systems? Ah. Do you put like do you move things to different stages? Yes. Is that how that works? Yes. Um, so basically, uh, what this system is is that is you have a, a space for different uh, uh, different stages of decomposition. You know, you start with the first bin, and you start uh, you keep it um, uh, do your proper recipe. You mix it, you water it, but gets to a point that you can't fill it up anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then. The idea is that you move this material to the next bin and start over here. Okay. In the process of doing that, all that outer material that hasn't been exposed to the core of your compost gets to be put in the core of the material and then covered with the rest. <coughs> and then the same thing happens. Then the next time this is filled up, you move this one to the third, this one to the second, and then you start a new one. Uh, what it does is basically you creating, again, you're paying attention to moisture, you're paying attention to the aeration each time. But not everybody's up to it because it's physical work, it requires uh, some uh, uh, you know, heavy lifting at times, depending on the size of your material. So uh, it's a set that has its pros and cons. You can do the same thing with a bin like this uh, using uh, a coarse group uh, later on. But it's all about how do you provide oxygen and how do you provide moisture to your system? Uh, and these are some different samples of type of composting containers. You can do trench composting where you basically create trenches. You throw all this organic waste and you cover it. Uh, I don't like it as much, but it seems to work for many people. Uh, you know, normally people that do trenching uh, will fill up all this trench, cover it, and won't touch it until the next year. And that's where they plant directly. Uh, then you have these heat mounts uh, where they're hard, they're, you know, they're cumbersome to manage because uh, uh, you know, they tend to fall apart, they tend to expand, uh, and they're kind of uh, difficult to manage. Then you have ways to contain the heat, you know, using straw bales, using single bins, or the three bins. The neat thing about that is that you can guarantee that there's insulation properties of your heat because you have, you know, at least a three by three by three size uh, that allows for that core to heat up. Here, things tend to, uh, to break down and start falling apart, and it's hard to keep it together. Um, so all depending on your and uh, your, your management capacity. And then you have the hogger culture, 
there is a method of basically building up organic matter and letting the composition, the, the, the composition to have happen over time, and then people plant on top of it, uh, mostly uh, squash uh, and other uh, nice crops. Uh, but eventually that will break down, and you have to, you have to build it up again. But it's a way of doing compost too. Yes. Yeah, for the trench. Yes. Style, um, what would be an adequate cover that would discourage animals and yet would allow for aeration or whatever other property? Yeah. Those are those are the the, um, the challenges of a system like that. You have to go a bit deeper uh, and then uh, cover it uh, with your best soil to create some insulation, some. Uh, buy a filter, people will put on top of that already made compost oh. because mo co most of uh, the compost will capture heat, will capture moisture, and will capture the odors. But there's no guarantee that animals will go in and, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, if you're covering it, you're creating anaerobic conditions. Uh, so whatever's happening there is an actual process, but you might not have the best um, uh, advantage or, or decomposing aerobically in the organic matter. Okay, so all this is about the soil food web. If you haven't heard about it, this is what I mean by talking, uh, you know, working with nature. In our soil, in our food, we have all these uh, wonderful microorganisms that are responsible for the breakdown of organic matter. It, it starts with bacteria, with fungi that have the enzymes and the capacity to break down the simple sugars and the much more complex carbon. Um, and of course, this is a prey predator relationship because in every scale you have, a, they are basically eating each other, they are into this connection, uh, they die, uh, they poop, they leave all this uh, waste in the soil, which is basically full of the nutrients that uh, are found mostly on our soils and organic matter. Uh, so, when you see worms, when you see you know centipedes, uh, ants, and other, it means that the rest of what's happening that you might not be able to see those, but if these are, these are present, you know that things are happening in your compost. You know that your soil is alive. When you don't find worms, that's you know you know you have to answer so why not? Uh, uh, so we work with this. We 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 create the condition for this to happening and for the nutrient cycling to. Uh, uh, to, to exist within our compost system. Okay. You can go next, yes. Mm -hmm. If you want to. Okay. I just had a little video there uh, uh, that I wanted to show you, but uh, I'm gonna move on uh, if you want to. Healthy living soil is filled with a balance of fungi, bacteria. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> okay. So let's go into what it takes. I call this re recipe de development, and this is things to pay attention. We might be doing this without paying attention to what we actually do. But we need to be able to combine in a certain proportion that organic waste that's coming from our kitchen with something that will balance the concentration of nitrogen, okay? Uh, that's what's called the CN ratio. We call it browns and greens. Uh, uh, and suddenly we want some type of feedstock that don't have any contaminants. We want to not have heavy metals, GMOs, herbicides, pesticides, PFAS, uh, PLAs, all these things are coming through our uh, food stream. Uh, so we have to make it in a proportion, and then we want to do it in a way to potential particle size. You know, we have to cut it. So we expose that material to uh, the microbes. We have to do it in a way that is not too heavy. When we just are composting uh, um, food, food is too heavy. And then when it's too heavy and it has a lot of water, it creates anaerobic conditions. And the poor things don't decompose well. Things start to smell. When you get to your compost pile and you start things smelling, you have to ask yourself, uh, is there a good balance of material here? Probably it's too heavy. Probably it's too, it has too much water. So bulk density is something that I pay attention to. The other thing is because we are dealing with the microbes, we pay attention to moisture. Like any living organism, we need air and we need water. If we don't have it in certain amount, things become dormant. The bacteria and the fungi and other will say, ah, this is not for me. They become dormant, they die, uh, this is not a good party, I'm gone. Uh, so things will come to a stop. The same with, with the oxygen. 
uh, and that's why we need to aerate. The telling the story of all this piece is an actual temperature. Okay. So this is it. This deli, this if you learn about something here today, it's about this draft. I'm so proud of this draft. Um, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that um, this is a triangle that um, represents the balance that you have to have in your column. Okay? You have all this spring material that's coming from your, uh, your with your kitchen uh, that has certain carbon and nitrogen proportion. Every organic matter has as part of the buildup carbon and nitrogen. Uh, greens have to have, uh, tend to have more than your brown material. So we need a, in our compost system carbon because the carbon is the energy to fuel the metabolism of microorganisms. They need certain amount. And they need nitrogen that is basically the source of proteins to build up their enzyme and to be able to replicate and grow. So it's part of a, like a providing a diet. Okay, and we need to give it into a certain proportion. Okay, now after you have that, uh, you have done that mixture, and you put it in your bin, you have to pay attention to your moisture. Okay, and they talk about between 40 and 65 percent moisture. That's something you can basically eyeball it with your hands. Anything above 65 percent, you may have too much water into the system, and the thing is that people, things might start is, is to swell because it becomes anaerobic. So you cannot too, put too much water. And if it's below 40%, things become inactive. Again, you know, these are not the conditions for us to do our work. Uh, call me when you're ready. Uh, so moisture is very, very important. The other is that we need oxygen. Uh, the thing is that anything below 5% of oxygen into the system, again, things become, uh, become anaerobic, uh, things start to smell, and things uh, stop uh, um, decomposing properly. So you need to keep that aeration going. Uh, and it's not that difficult to do. I already mentioned the particle size, chopping you know, in quarter pieces as much as you can. Uh, if you have done things right, the temperature is going to tell you the story. Things, in a matter of two days, things start to heat up. And you start to hit in temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 110, 110. The optimum for a, a slow decomposition, it will be between 110 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you think, do things properly, you might have very high uh, percentage, uh, temperatures. In the industry, if you're selling compost, uh, you have to reach more than 130 degrees of uh, Fahrenheit for three or more days, because the concern uh, is that you have to be killing. You have to be killing pathogens. And you have to be killing weeds. You know things like Salmonella, like E. coli, and any other pathogens that might come through the food. You know you really need to hit those temperatures. If you're doing backyard composting, uh, that's not an issue, uh, or a very uh, you know very low issue. But when you're dealing with sources of food that you don't have uh, under your control, uh, that's a requirement uh, to have. So when you talk about oxygen, that's like you aerating it, correct? Yes, yes. Um, so, and if you, if you have done everything right, there's something that you expect to happen over time. You have a very incipient system that's starting to, to um, increase in temperature. Why is it trying to it start to increase in temperature? Because that means that the population of, of microorganisms starting to grow. And they're breathing and they're producing CO2, and they're producing uh, water, and they're heating up the system. So every time the temperature is telling you, oh, things are happening. I'm doing something right. I have provided the conditions of, of, uh, of carbon to nitrogen, the condition of water, and the condition of oxygen. And the temperature is telling you that things are active, and they're nice work. Once they heat a certain temperature, another type of population of microbes come into it, much more specialized, much more tolerant of that temperature. And they are able to break down a, you know, um, what they, what's a, that's what they call thermobilic bacteria, a, that they are very heat tolerant and then tend to break down, you know, proteins, fats, hemicellulose, and cellulose. A, different from the, you know, early a, rapid uptake of soluble sugars that are uh, much more available. After that period of time, temperature starts to come down and then you have what's a curing stage you have a repopulation of the early uh, microorganisms that are able to tackle now 
uh, much more complex uh, carbons like lignin um, that are much more resistant and that's where the work of fungi plays a role and that's when you start seeing your compost it become much browner, much darker, it starts to look at 70% chocolate. And that's what tells you that things are being humidified and things are being much more stable. Do you see your mushrooms growing? Yes. yes. Okay. And then, let me talk a little bit about carbon to nitrogen ratio. I talked to you that all of the mag organic matter is made of uh, plenty of carbon combined with less amount of nitrogen. And we call CN ratio the proportion of these two elements. Uh, and the ratio influences nutrient availability and the rate of decomposition. And, and we talk about a sweet, a sweet point uh, spot between 25 to 30 percent carbon. Here's the key: if we have too high, you know, we have too much carbon. Let's say we put too much lead or too much wood chip. Basically, the decomposition slows down. Basically, all that little nitrogen that, that, is, that is there is being, being basically um, uh, sequestered to be able to break down all that carbon that is in place. And therefore, things it slows down and it's not working. On the other side, if you have a ratio that is too low, it's, you mean the meaning that you have an excess of nitrogen, things become very anaerobic, it will smell. That's when people put a lot of their food, oh, things are not working and it's smelling bad and it's all mushy. It's because they haven't balanced their material with enough carbon, okay? All boils down to, after you have done all the calculations, is that for any, every unit, let's say you have a, this is your unit, this is your compost bin in your kitchen, okay? So for any unit of your greens, you combine it with one or two of brown. That's, a, that's the most simple thing. And that's what people miss a lot. Uh, let's say if you just fill it half, then it will be half of your carbon, okay? Uh, so whatever unit you have, you have to add one or two proportionally to your greens. That's the most important thing. What are these browns that you're adding? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, before I get to the browns, this is just to tell you that when you have the proper nitrogen ratio of 30 to 1, the temperatures go really, really high. If you have too much brown, your temperature doesn't reach as high. That means the population of microbes are not growing as much and therefore they're not decomposing the material. The same thing happens with particle size. If the particle is too uh, coarse, too big, things do not heat up. But if you chop it and reduce it, immediately you are exposing that material to microorganisms and therefore the temperature goes up. Temperatures always tell you that the part is good and things are happening. Uh, Okay, so some of the ingredients that we talk about carbon-rich material, you have a long list uh, that I'm not going to go through, but it tells you uh, uh, those that have high concentration of carbon compared to nitrogen. You can classify those, you can cli classify those into those that are below 25 to 1. You can find these tables online. Uh, blue scraps tend to be around 18 to 1. Uh, the, mat ma the manures also are pretty uh, high in nitrogen. Uh, your grass, your coffee, your um, spent grains, those are very high in nitrogen. But then you have other browns uh, that has low moisture content and low uh, bulk density, uh, which like things like soda, straw, paper, uh, well bedded horse manure. And then you have ones that are more into the middle. So. Uh, you can classify them in, in different ways, and these are used mostly when you do calculation, when you have a spreadsheet, where you have three or four or five feedstocks that you need to see how you balance. But when you do it with your kitchen scraps, it basically all boils down to uh, what I just told you. For every unit of green, you add one or two units of brown. And your browns are your leaves that you collect in your house, could be straw, could be paper, newspaper, uh, those are the materials that you might find more available. In this, I would recommend in the fall, you know, find um, um, a wire mesh, two by four, that you can find online and create a little uh, bin, and you put your leaf there. And that will be your source of combining it with your food scraps. Uh, and uh, it's also a, a place where the leaves start to decompose, uh, and it uh, gets reducing size. But it's the best way, it looks neat, 
uh, but also it's handy. It's not that you have to, oh, I have to compost, and then you have to go to the backyard and start scraping. No, take time in the fall and do that, because then in the spring you won't have anything anymore. Somebody took it, somebody else, uh, uh, you know, your landscaper take it elsewhere. So see it as a resource for your compost. Um, can you so, move that backwards one so I can get a picture of the so one thing that I'm, I'm avoiding right now in the system that I have is flowers because they come many, at this time of year come from stores uh, and none of the people that deal with flowers can guarantee that doesn't have herbicide or pesticide or anything like that. So I don't like to have them. Uh, another thing that is I'm not accepting now right is lint that comes from the houses that tend to are known to have a lot of, um, uh, of microplastics, uh, things to avoid. Uh, but mainly, we're not measuring the same content of each one of them. We know that food scrap comes from many sources and it variates in terms of carbon nitrogen content. But it still has a lot of water and, ha uh, and has a lot of nitrogen and therefore behaves very consistently uh, over time. Uh, so that unit and that uh, ratio that I was telling you, it works fine for backyard compost. You have questions? Yes. You have wood ash up there. We have a wood stove. We yep. get ash out of the wood stove. Is that going to ruin the pH, or is it going to create uh, problems? You see, you, you, I, I woke up this morning and say, if they ask me the question, I am going to Yes. Uh, the thing with wood ash is that um, uh, two things. It's very alkaline, so you know you don't have, you can't put too much uh, because it can really uh, change the whole pH of, of your compost. The most problematic with wood ash, if you combine it with a fertilizer, it can generate a lot of ammonia and create a problem. But if just for your compost, you know, just add it, you know, uh, two or three scoops, it won't hurt it. It will actually add to the, uh, the um, value, the nutritional value of your compost. Uh, but you don't want too much. Uh, yeah. Cool. In the browns, do you need have a variety of things or can it be all leaves? Okay, that's a very good question. Ideally, you want to have as much diverse feedstock as, as, as possible. Why? Because then you're going to have a, you're going to invite a great diverse of microorganisms. Okay? But sometimes we don't have that. Uh, we work with what, with what we have. Uh, I sometimes collect uh, spent grains uh, down from the New England uh, uh, brewery, which is a nice high nitrogen and the build, you know, it really heats up your system. And I, now that I work out of common ground, we, now we have access to straw and to animal manure that I didn't have before. I was just working with lead. And I've seen how that has changed the quality of compost uh, because of that diversity of feedstock. And so yes, it would be nice if you have that diversity, but if not, then, you know, certainly work with what you have. Yes. Um, uh, corn oh, cobs. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, corn cobs. Um, so you have those on both lists. There. Yes. We, our, our experience is that they like never break down, <laughs> and and we're way too lazy to chop them all up. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it, 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 I work with a lot of cobs, and they break down nicely. They, oh. Oh yeah, they break down. <laughs> What's your they, secret? They're not using the right ones. Right one. yes. uh, so when when things don't break down, yeah. you have to ask the question, well. Why are not breaking down? Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So, uh, if you have if you have that balance in that triangle I was telling you, it will it will go like this. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so sometimes the ratio. Yeah. <laughs> so you have materials like grasses that uh, you know when they are fresh they are considered more greens, but as they decay and they become much more brown, they behave more like a brown material. Now. A person like me that is doing all the calculations, you know, and weighing stuff to make sure that things are balanced, uh, that's something that I feel I need to do. But in your case, in the backyard, uh, you know, it's it's nice something to, to to know, but you don't need to. Here, you have to pay more attention again your ratio of your units, and things are moist enough, and that you aerate, uh, and that will be a long, long way. You have eggshells on both sides yeah. too. Yeah, eggshells are considered. Um, they are considered, again, when they're fresh, they're considered to be, a, where is it, sorry, when they're fresh, they're considered more a, as a, um, where is it? Oh, the eggshell. Oh, no, I think that's, a, that's an error. 
and this is an error. It's, it's considered more like an eggshell because of the amount of carbon. Uh, the thing is that it's cons it, by trying to explain what screws grabs, you know, these are things that you might have in your composting. But, you know, this, as a, again, screw scraps can be vary a lot depending on what you produce and always a range between 80 to 1 to 20, 22 per 1, uh, depending on the study. Uh, but it's considered, uh, you know, a more green material than anything else. Yes. Animal burning, is that farm animal or pet animal? <laughs> uh, farm animals, mostly. Okay. The thing with bedding with uh, with uh, domestic animals is the concern is uh, of any medicine that might linger to the the tract of the animal and will linger in your compost and then gets into your soil. Okay. And people don't know much about the bed. And if your system is not heating up because it's too small, you might not be killing any pathogens that might come from the school uh, pieces of, of these animals. Uh, if you have systems that are heating up, 130 degrees or more, mm -hmm. then you make make sure that things are, 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 are done. Uh, part of having um, a certification for for organic for the organic use of your compost, you have to show that you have been able to heat up uh, your uh, compost uh, on a period of time. Yes. When you listed uh, cotton fabric and you talked about paper before, how does ink or dye affect yeah. the compost? And uh, now uh, that question comes mostly with the uh, newspapers and the uh, and the paper of magazines. Uh, that now they they use soy-based ink, and uh, so that you know very much uh, easy to decompose. Mm -hmm. Before you, you know when you have the phenols and other much more heavy duty inks that you know, that wasn't allowed. Uh, here is basically your your plastics and the, your microplastic and your heavy chemicals that you want to have it. So be mindful. And sometimes, you know, what people do is they search online, is this composable? And you'll find a lot of answers uh, uh, about the, the nature of your feedstock. Uh, these are other ways to, to classify your greens, but it's telling you that you have your high nitrogen and whether these are food for uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, and so on. But you want, again, diversity in your feedstock to be able to provide a wide range of microorganisms in your compost. This, uh, this is just to show that all this can be calculated. There are very simple uh, formulas to when you have three or four type of totally different type of feedstock, you can actually put this into uh, uh, a little spreadsheet and help you to determine your carbon to nitrogen nitro ratio. So that's something that I do, but again, for backyard composting, you don't need it. I just put it here to show you that when I just use food waste and I just use leaves and I have uh, a carbon nitrogen ratio of almost 30, okay, it basically ends up to be two buckets of five gallon, of five gallon of uh, leaves and one bucket of food scrap. So that's, that's why I was mentioning about the unit. So after all this calculation, it all goes back to uh, 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 the ratio of buckets. Okay. Things to avoid: perennial weeds. If you're not heating up, you might just passing that perennial weed mm -hmm. to your compost back to your soil. Uh, disease or insect-infested plant material. The same thing. If you, things are not heating up, there's something you want to avoid to put in your system. Any chemically treated rat clipping or weeds. Uh, you know, people not pay attention. Uh, to what they put into the into the garden, and then they want to compost it. This is a no-no uh, in my case. Uh, this, like kitchen trap, meat, fish, and bones. This is a recommendation by municipality. Basically, municipality tell you, I don't trust your composting skills. Therefore, you shouldn't be putting uh, meat, fish, or bones because they attract. They are a nuisance. Uh, and they say, well, if you, I'm an expert in compost. Uh, you have been trained over years. Uh, and you can actually, if you do things right, you can minimize the potential of attracting animals, which is a concern. Uh, odors and animals is the most a concern for municipality. So you can actually compost in your backyard. Right. One of the problems is fat, oils, and grease in large quantities. If you put in gallons and gallons of, of, uh, of you know, oils and fat and grease, certainly it's gonna, things are going to slow down, but still will decompose. Dairy products, the same thing with the kitchen scraps, is a matter of quantity and it's a matter of management. 
uh, you can reduce any potential uh, uses in the way you manage them. Feces, the concern is about pathogens. If things are not heating up again, uh, these are concerns that might get into the system. And this is the answer for the ash and sawdust that I wrote down this morning at 5 o'clock because somebody wasn't asking. I was going to forget, and it's here. <laughs> okay. And this is what I basically ask my clients of what I, they can compost and whatnot. Uh, so you can see is a, is a wide, wide range of material. Uh, one thing that is happening right now is that you have what's called a compostable. You go and you buy compostable bags and compostable straws and compostable utensils. Uh, the thing is that many times uh, they, are, they have added um, uh, fluorides like PFAS which make them much more sturdier. So even though they are a bioplastic based out, based out of corn, a, you know, another a, type of starch, they might still be adding this. And the, the, the Biodegradable Product Institute was not measuring if they actually have PFAS on it. And the thing is that when things don't decompose in a matter of 30 days, if you're doing things right, and it lingers more than uh, uh, 30 days, it's, it behaves more as a biodegradable material. And then you have to ask, well, why is it not breaking as much? Um, so then you have to look at the nature of where it's coming from. Now this, the industry is catching up. Now they're really identifying those that are using PFAS. And they're, now they're moving to PLAs, which is a, a bioplastic. And the problem with the bioplastic is the way that they are made. And sometimes are GMO, sometimes are, are uh, the cost of making the bioplastic are very, very high. Um, so uh, it's a concern that nobody really knows. It looks like a solution, but really knows how that is behaving. Uh, when they see, they see that things are, have broken down. But when you look at microscope, you see remnants of, uh, of potential microplastic that you want to see there. So this is an open question. Anything you can do to avoid it, uh, and uh, it's important. And these are other that are things that I mentioned: the heavy metals. The genetic, uh, genetically engineered organisms, the herbicide, the PFAS, and the PLA, all these are known to, um, to uh, they are being found in compost, mostly in the largest, you know, meaningful type of compost, because it's very hard to control what's coming in and coming out. Uh, so Maine, for instance, uh, Vermont have had really big scares of having uh, these composters, having some of the material, and then impacting the soil of farms. Uh, so sometimes more it's more beautiful because you can manage much better uh, the quality of your compost. Okay, this is uh, a method, the lasagna method. When you have a bin, <laughs> like uh, they call it the lasagna method, I don't know why. Uh, but basically you start, whether it be your pile, whether it be your compost bin, whether your three bin system, you build a base of very um, stocky material, uh, Things that are very light, it could be branches, could be straw, could be things that it will be very bulky. Uh, and then you start building your compost. Uh, you basically are combining layers of brown, in this case will be your, your, your leaf, for instance, your backyard, and then you add your kitchen scraps. And you put it in the center uh, so it doesn't reach to the edges, so you are capping with the next layer of brown, you're capping your greens. And this is a very passive way of doing it. Okay? You just build it, you put your bucket, and then you cap it. And that's how you build it. It gets to a point that you have to aerate this. Okay? And then two tools. There, there's a, um, a, a, like a corkscrew type of tool uh, that is like bring, opening a big bottle of wine if you like wine. You know, and then you're basically fluffing that material. And there's another one that is like a spear you punch through the, to the center, you turn it, there are two asps that, that are, get opened, and then you fluff the material. I like the corkscrew one. Uh, it's very easy because when you get, um, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you, can't do, if you can't move it anymore, you just go back and uh, backtrack and need to, to take out. The other one, you have to, by force, you know, fight with the weight of that material. This is one method. The method that I like, is that before putting it into the bin, I mix it in the outside. Uh, it will just speed the whole thing because I'm exposing the green with the browns all together before I put it in. This is the, the much simpler one. 
if this will work, it's just going to take a little bit longer. <coughs> so you mix the two together before you put it in there? Yes. Exactly. And then you put the brown on the top? Yes. Okay. So um, uh, this is what I do. Uh, I put my branches below, I start with a base of, of, uh, of leaves, and then the new batch that's coming in, I pay attention. If it's a quarter full, half full, or full of my bin, and then I know that's the amount that I need to put in. And I mix it in the outside. I have an extra bin where I mix it in, I chop it with my, my uh, shovel uh, to make things that, looking for that quartz material, mix it in, and then put it on top. And then there, I create another layer of, of brown. Sometimes I have compost already made. I like to put compost as a biofilter because, again, it will inoculate your bin with a microorganism that already exists in the already made compost. It creates a nice biofilter. It captures it, any odor. It will capture the moisture and the heat. And things speed up very quickly. Um, earlier, I had an understanding of a three to one or a, a green to brown. But this image gives me a very different impression than 3 to 1. It looks like the green is uh, is only half. It's like 50, 50, or 40, 60, where the brown is 60. Yeah. Uh, this is my experience. Um, everywhere you read, you talk, you're talking about 3 to 1, you know, a lot of carbon. Uh, and that will work because you're still within the range of what is required. What I've noticed is that because I do this on a weekly basis, it really accelerates the decomposition. You're allowing uh, a lot of nitrogen to be present uh, in a nice proportion with brown, and things will speed up. Okay. Okay. So that thing is that I like to save on my carbon because I know that I won't have leaves so, for so long. If I haven't accumulated enough leaves, I'll be using too much leaves, and then I don't get to uh, properly and effective, efficiently use them. Okay. So that's my observation. Yeah. Well, my question is, now that it's winter, compost pile, and when there is snow on top, how am I to incorporate my kitchen waste into this? Throw it right on the snow and just wait? Listen, uh, then it, you know, you have to cover your, your um, uh, if you, there's a way to cover your heat so you can remove the tarp. It's open. It's open. Yes. Okay. So that's it. <laughs> yeah. Just open a hole. So that's what many people do. They have this big pile of leaves. They open a little hole and then they push all oh, that green. And then I've done it. And that worked. That works. It will just take longer. It will just take longer. Uh, but you might. Uh, when, when I talk when I talk about these things, I talk about how can I do it in a way that is expedient, in a way that captures the uh, that I don't lose uh, too much nutrient. Uh, and that I have the best compost I can ever have in my house to use in my soil. So depending on what you do, you can have the most amount of compost in the most uh, least amount of time, or you have, or, or, you, have, or you can wait until bad things happen. Nature will do the work for you. So you know, here is for I mean, inspire you to you know to get acquainted and learn about the thing if you want to have a better product. Nobody's going to come and judge you know. Your, your neighbor is going to say, oh, that's a good combo. No, they're not going to come and do that. The plant will tell you, oh, I like what you produce. Those are the ones that will be telling you. Know your neighbor. So. <laughs> Hillary will, will come. <laughs> okay. This is about, about density, and I'm going to talk about it, but it's basically to control for the, the, how, how heavy that material is. So this is an example of a... You know, these are your um, compost particles that, that you're putting in your bin. Uh, and then you need free air space, and you need pore space, and these are laminates of water. This is where the microorganisms live, and they thrive. If you have too much water, uh, or things are too compacted, these spaces are not free anymore, and things will stop decomposing properly. So things cannot be, that's why we combine it with leaves or with wood chips, so things become uh, lighter. Uh, I think decompose, things start to break down, they become smaller inside, and they start compact. Uh, so the importance of airspace is, 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 is key in all this. One thing that to mention is that these are an example of oxygen depletion in your compost. In a matter 
after you have fluffed and oxygenated your system and things are cooking, the population of organisms are so large and things are so hot that they're going to, in a matter of minutes, they deplete the oxygen that's in the system. In a matter of 20 minutes, more or less. So it becomes it come from aerobic condition to an anaerobic condition. So that's something I, I like to avoid, and that's why I use a system where I'm pushing air into the chamber uh, every 30 minutes. In your case, as long as you are mixing this once a week, is incredibly how things will decompose very quickly. Very quickly. And if it comes to aeration, you want to aerate uh, to maintain the aerobic conditions, to mitigate odors, to manage the pile, uh, temperature of the pile, uh, and you want to reduce the loss of nutrients. When you have a lot of anaerobic condition, you have, have a loss of loss of nutrients, like methane, you have ammonia, things become very volatile, like, you know, and then you lose the quality of your compost. When you see that your, your pile should be shrinking, but it, if it shrinks by half, it means there's a lot of things that have been lost in the system. A lot of CO2, a lot of ammonia, a, a lot of methane has left the system, and therefore it's not in your organic matter anymore. And so uh, providing the air for microorganisms is very, very key. And this comes from my favorite tool. This is the tool that I was telling you, the cork. You can do the heavy lifting by aerating with a three-pin system. You can have a tumbler uh, and have somebody, you know, tumble and, you know, aerate the system. But they come very, very heavy. Uh, and sometimes, they, you know, the base is not as strong to be able to hold all that material. Uh, and gets to a point that it fills up very quickly. You can't fill up this, this, this tumbler because it becomes very heavy and you can't turn it. With another system like the three-pin system or uh, black system, uh, bin, you know, you can always have a second one and it's easy to move. Uh, but this one, what, when it's there, that's it. You can't do it anymore uh, because it's too heavy. So I have this one that, that looks like a spear, but I highly, highly recommend this one. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, one thing about anaerobic conditions, they love to thrive in very low levels of oxygen. Many of the anaerobic uh, organisms are pathogens. You recognize that that's happening because of these type of odors in your rotten egg, sour milk, decaying flesh, vomit, ammonia, vinegar. All these are things when you, you know, they're very pungent type of smells. And that tells you something's happening there. I mean, am I adding too much water? Am I not uh, uh, providing too much oxygen? Are things too compacted? Uh, these are the ways to think about uh, when things have start smelling, it's because the conditions are not right. And you know, one of the problem with this type of um, of, uh, of compost is that yes, you're going to see that it, 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 things have decomposed, but they might be very mature. It might create a lot of acids and alcohol that might hurt your seedlings and your plants. So that's something you really, really want to avoid. The phytotoxicity of, uh, of uh, not well decomposed material can really harm your plants. And then moisture, you know, uh, this is something important to, there's a very simple way of how to check. Once you have, you, you, you've done your, your mixture uh, and you're aerating, uh, you know, you have to observe if things are moist enough. And this was called a uh, uh, hand squeeze test, where you grab a handful of compost, and then you squeeze the material at hand, and check for drippings. The other thing you're gonna check is to take, uh, uh, you know, see if the material holds together or it breaks apart. So this is an indicator. So if, you, if the material sticks together and drips, and the hand is wet and dripping, is more or less 60%, okay? So you're on, the, uh, on that range. If it sticks together and drips, and your hand is moist and not dripping, it's considered 50%. And if it's crumbly and does not stick together, the, uh, the, hand, the hand is relatively dry, it's 40% or less. That's what you need to add. What I do on a weekly basis, I come to my compost bin, I make sure that I have enough brown for the amount of, of green that I have, I mix it in, put it in, add water, okay, and then I cap it, whether it be with brown or already made compost. And sometimes I just put the, my leaves, because I don't have compost, or I put compost and my leaves and then add water on top. 
So the order doesn't matter. What's, mo what's most important here is that the browns get wet because the, the food has around 60 to 70 percent or more of water content. When the cells of that organic matter start to break down, it will release that water. Mm -hmm. But your leaves that might be too dry because it's being exposed to the heat. As, you know, sometimes uh, the leaves that even though you put water, it becomes uh, uh, hydrophobic. It means that it won't absorb water at all. Uh, so you need to be able to allow that, uh, that material to absorb the water by you know, paying attention to how dry is the ambient uh, on your place. So this is a way, and it's, got, it's like cooking. It's got to get to a point that you'll be able to say, no, I need to add water. I just add water systematically as I, after I aerate and make sure that the, all that bin has exposure to that. Um, and then temperature, I was pretty explaining a little bit about temperature. This is the active zone optimal for the quicker composting for most backyard compost. But if you need to reach those high temperatures to kill pathogens, you have to go higher uh, for a number of times. Um, and then people ask, well, when should I turn? I say turn every once a week. Because you're not going to be there with a thermometer checking, oh, it's time to turn. Uh, that's not practical. Uh, if you're busy with your day-by-day -day life, you have kids, uh, you have other things to do, the best is that once you're going to put new material in, turn it. Uh, and that will speed up the decomposition process. Okay? People, in this graphic, what they say, they look at temperature, and they look at the highest point, and when the thing starts to come down in temperature, then you turn it to expose that material that hasn't been, uh, you know, uh, impacted by the heat. So it gets opportunity to be in the core, and they see how the temperature goes up, and when it comes down, they turn it again. I don't pay attention to that in backyard composting. What I do, I just turn it once a week, uh, using that core. I arrive here, I really like it. <laughs> uh, and then another thing that I pay attention to is to cover it. It's important to cover uh, from the elements, from your big storms of snow and from the um, from water, uh, because the possibility of uh, inundating your system can create uh, anaerobic conditions. Um, so I prefer to water myself and pay attention to that. That allow I use mature compost again to, because it serves as, as a way to inoculate the system. It serves as a biofilter to mitigate odors, retain CO2 and ammonia, and that. All that nutrients are kept into my brain. Okay? And this is just a list of a compost troubleshooting. I'm not going to get into that. Just think about what I just mentioned. That trans are things decomposing, are things are breaking down, are things are heating up. If not, if things are not heating up, and things you see that are not, that my pie is not diminishing in size, you have to ask yourself is it an issue of water? It's an issue of oxygen. It's an issue of how much brown and green I put in. Those are the things that will tell you what you're doing wrong, or what needs to be done to correct for uh, your compost. It's that simple. Uh, this is just a chart to ask your question. Well, things are are things are not heating up. You see that they mostly are looking at temperature and they look at moisture. Uh, and then odors is another indicator. Uh, but with that triangle, we'll respond to most of your questions about composting in your backyard. And then at the end, how do I know that my compost is well? And it, you have to go through what's called a maturing phase. Uh, you go through a curing phase where there gets to a point where your compost doesn't heat up anymore. First, you have to leave it alone because you keep adding, of course, things are going to still happen. But once you leave it alone, once you fill up your bin, you have to leave it alone and start a second one. Unless you don't want to uh, uh, build a second one, you just wait for the first one to get cured. Depending on your management system, your compost in your bin should be done in a matter of three months. Okay? If you're not managing properly, it's going to take longer. What I do at the UU uh, down in, in New Haven is that we have three of those black ones and, uh, and allow them to fill up. They leave it alone, I step the second one. By the time I'm done with the second one, the first one is already done. So I can always go back to the first one. I have a third one just in case our volume increases much more. But uh, again, it's to be 
managing in a certain consistent manner, at least once a week. Never mind, you have to go to occasion, you cannot you took an attend one month, that's okay. Nature will do the will, uh, do its work. Yeah. But at the end, you're gonna have material that is very stable. There's no more heating up, you won't be able to recognize all of the original material that you put in. Uh, the uh, things are very crumbly, it smells very earthy, the color resembles a 70% chocolate. Uh, um, and uh, there's uh, some tests that you can find online, it's called the Sobita test, that will measure the amount of CO2 and ammonia that your compost pile uh, can generate and will tell you if it's mature or not and it's ready to be used. Um, many people don't care about this, they say it's crumbly enough, the color is beautiful enough, the, uh, the odors of it as well, I'm just going to use it in my, in, uh, in, in my garden. Um, you know, in the industry, people are paying attention mostly to the absence of contaminants and pathogens. They are picking up on how much organic matter is in your <coughs> compost and the PhD, the electrical conductivity uh, of that uh, com compost. And these are things that you need to send to test. Uh, and sometimes you know, when you're buying compost, you want to know what's the feedstock that has been used for that compost and whether they have tested their compost for quality assurance. Uh, mostly if you're growing things in your farm. Uh, so these are, they, these are things that are published. These are things that you want to know about the compost that you buy. There are beautiful bags out there, beautiful crabs, you know, colorful from Maine, <laughs> but nobody knows where the source of that compost comes from. That's a lot of lobsters. Um, and then something you can do at home, you just can take a, a bunch of compost and you know, put some seeds, uh, uh, fast-growing seeds like cucumber, for instance, and see if they germinate. Of 10 seeds or 20 seeds, how much of them have germinated. That tells you, oh, my compost is, is, is nice for my... The other way, the other thing you can do is to take a bag, fill it up with compost, wait five or seven days, and when you open it up, it shouldn't have any foul odor. And that's another way that you feel, okay, this is safe enough for me to use. And that's it. This is well. These are recommendations you can find online of how much compost to use. There's a lot of speculation in terms of well, should we add? You know, we shouldn't be adding too much compost because uh, you know my compost might have a lot of phosphorus, uh, and then phosphorus it doesn't mobilize as much, and then I can have too much uh, uh, phosphorus. And if you have too much phosphorus, it's going to hinder uh, the accessibility of zinc and iron and other. Uh, so the, the, there's concern about. Uh, how to manage the nutrient value of your compost. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is more problematic. It uh, might be for a farm that has a nutrient management uh, uh, plan that wants to be aware of how much the compost is contributing to the nutrient uh, that they need to put for the type of compost. <coughs> um, so, um, again, this uh, compost is something of slow release of nutrients. A lot of the nutrients is hold in the structure of the organic matter and the body of the microbes. Uh, it's slow release because it needs to be <coughs> mineralized, it needs to be um, uh, broken down to make it in an available form, and that is the work of the biology that is in the soil. Uh, um, but the properties are true in terms of what this brings to the structure of your soil and how it can improve the health of your soil for growing healthy plants and healthy crops. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Any question that if you don't ask today, you won't be able to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thank you. If we can just hold off questions one second. I just want to thank you again for coming. And also um, thank everybody that made this happen, which is Zara Farm, as well as our sustainability committee. So we have Mary Gorm from Zara here. We have Leslie Lyons, Laura Fernandez Ferrante, we have DJ Hearn and Alyssa Anderson, and we have oh, Alana Mercutio too. So thank you everybody. Thank you. And also one more little tickle bit. Um, I understand a lot of you do compost, which is fantastic, and you should keep doing that. But if you don't, or if you know friends and neighbors that are like on the fence of if they should do it, as you noticed in the survey, we were saying would people be interested in a residential compost pickup, like curbside the way that some people get their trash picked up. 
We are going to be doing a bit of a pilot program. If you know anyone that's interested, or if you are interested, there's a sign up in the back. It's going to be limited somewhat at first um, to see how it works. So um, let us know. Contact us if you are interested. But and so. One thing that I was going to say, listen, uh, it would be nice to do this in another moment in the actual field, in some place in the back of somebody's house or in a farm where we can actually, you know, manipulate the food scraps, see how it looks like, and, and work it out. Because it's very, very simple. Uh, so we have a chance uh, late in the future, you know, I'm willing also to... We would to love to have you back anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Yes.